Hey everyone, this is Alicia Barlow, president of Tell Somebody Foundation, and I'm on Rebuilding the Beast with Festus Ezeli. Hey guys, welcome to Rebuilding the Beast. I'm your host, Festus Ezeli, NBA player turned podcast host. And on this show, I'm going to have a lot of my inspiring friends come on to share with you their rebuilding journeys. I hope you can take the tips from their lives and apply it to your life as well. Oh, and don't forget to hit subscribe, like, comment, share with a friend. Uh, yeah, all the things. All right. I'll see you guys soon. Alicia Barlow. Is that how I say it? Am I, did I yeah. say it right? Yeah. Welcome to Rebuilding the Beast. How you doing today? Good. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course. Of course. Thank you for wanting to come on and share your story. Um, where are you calling from today? Uh, the Bay Area, California. Best place on earth. Bay Area. I told you I left my heart over there. What happened? Left- Why you leave? Why did I leave? Oh, man, you know, business gets in the way and all this, all this other stuff. But, you know, I'm back there so often. It's still home forever. Uh, but we're not talking about me right now. We're talking about you. I want to talk about your story. You have a shirt on right now that says, tell somebody. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, basically, I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse. I was molested by my grandfather. When I was younger, my mom used to take me to her dad's house to be babysat if she needed to go to work or, you know, I had school vacation. And basically, he used to touch my private areas. And my mom and dad never taught me about my body. They never taught me, like, what was off limits. And so my grandfather started off with the tickle game. He would actually tickle me under my private areas. And when he saw that I didn't tell him to stop, he knew that he could continue. So he used to wait until my grandmother would leave and he would take me into a room and close the door and actually show me pornographic magazines and tell me that people who loved each other did these kind of things. And being that that was my grandfather, I believed him. And so I did do some of those things. But I always felt uncomfortable about it. And when I was sick, I actually told my aunt that her dad was touching me. And I asked, is it okay for people to touch your private areas? She said, no, why? And I said, because your dad is touching me there. And she was like, oh, wow, you know, that's wrong. I'm going to make sure it stops. And she was like, so, you know, just wait. So she told my mother and my other sis, my other aunt, and they actually confronted my grandfather. And he admitted to it. He said that the devil made him do it and that he apologized. But he told them that they had to promise not to tell so when I got home my mother pulled me into a room and told me that I had to keep this a secret that I had to keep it a secret from my father because my dad might kill my grandfather and then my dad would go to jail and I had to keep it a secret from everyone or my grandfather would go to jail and he would die and so she put all that guilt on me as a six-year-old and so that's kind of where Tell Somebody started. It's just based off of sexual abuse that I endured as a child. And it's just a message to empower people to speak up and tell their story and to keep telling so that they can get their freedom and healing. That's so, that's so powerful because look, you, you did do your job. You did tell somebody. You told the person who was supposed to be in charge of you. Um, why, do you think, why do you think she did that? Um, I mean, it's one answer. It was her father. They say that one in three girls and one in five boys are abused as a child. That's a lot. And they said that 95% of child molesters are a family member or a close friend. It's somebody who has access to your children. It's not the homeless person down the street. It's the person that's babysitting them. It's your uncle. It's your cousin. It's their basketball coach, people that have access. And so she didn't want to send her father to jail. And so that's why she kept it a secret. It's so common. The, the idea of sexual abuse is so common. I, had a, I did a podcast with a guy who just got out of prison. And he was talking about some of the rage and the things that he felt when he was younger. He never had an outlet, but he didn't understand. And it was as a result of sexual abuse as a kid that he didn't fully know how to explain. And in his case, it was his father's brother's wife it was something crazy to where it was like somebody was abusing him but he couldn't tell anybody because he was in this weird position and a family member 
that's why he couldn't go. And, you know, it, your story is so powerful because it reaches so many people. It reaches the women, it reaches the guys, it reaches a guy who just got out of prison. And now I'm such, I'm in such awe of you sharing your story to help other people. This is what this podcast is about. It's an idea that you can go through something and you can rebuild yourself up, but you don't just do it for yourself, right? You do it and you do it for yourself at first, but then when you, when you become the beast that you are, mm -hmm. then you go with your story. And so I dub you a beast for doing what you're doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. After 20 years, you're finally able to break your silence. How did that moment feel to finally let go of that burden? Um, you know, growing up, not only did my mom and dad not teach me about my body, but they never taught me about God. So I actually used to cuss God out when I was a child in my room and say, you know, F you, God, why is my life messed up? I got this messed up family, but all my friends and everyone around me are smiling and, you know, they got functional families. And it wasn't until I was older that I started finding God in my own. And for seven days straight, I actually was telling my cousin and praying to God, like, how can I tell my dad I've been abused? I want to bring awareness to molestation so I can help other people going through it, mainly kids that are going through it. Because you go to school and they have dare that teaches you about drugs, but no one's in school is teaching you about your body and how even if it's your family members touching you, you still have to tell somebody. So for seven days straight, I prayed and asked God and I talked to my cousin. I said, how do I tell my dad? How do I tell my dad? And on the seventh day, I walked into my dad's house and he said, Alicia, your younger brother, who's four years younger than me, called me today and told me that he was molested by your grandfather as a child. Did it happen to you too? And the moment he said that I had tears coming down my eyes. And I knew it was God telling me, like, okay, you've been asking for seven days how to tell your dad, here you go. So I told him. And, of course, I broke down and cried. He broke down and cried. But it was an immediate, I'm talking about immediate weight lifted off my shoulders. Like, immediate. Like, I always tell people growing up, even though I'm confident and secure with myself now, I always grew up feeling ugly, insecure, feeling like I didn't belong. Um, I didn't know my worth, so I gave myself to boys and men who didn't know my worth, people who were just using me, people who didn't love me because I didn't love myself. And it wasn't until I was 28 years old and I told my dad that all that was just like, it just went away. It just flew away like a bird that just flew. And so I knew that I wanted all survivors to feel that because there's people who are 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 who are still holding on to that secret. Who want to even take it to the grave and it's like i'm just here to tell you like that's not the way it's not you said a lot right there that that we need to unpack first off when we go through tough times we always start off like god why me i've been there and a lot of my friends have been there and we sit there like man what's what's going on god why do bad things happen to good people especially a child do you have no no fault in this world like it's you just are existing and somebody has this, these evil hands over you and it, it turns into something that affects you for a lot of your life. Now, what would you do um, or how do you advise kids who are in this situation to, to act? You know, the kids who are in, currently in the situation, what do you say to them? Um, well, I have this Amazon's bestseller. It's called yeah. Tell Body the Basic. And I actually go to different schools and I'm able to put my book on a projector screen and educate a whole school of 600 kids within an hour. And this is my main page. It shows the body part and it lets them know that these are all the parts that are private and no one is supposed to touch and you're not supposed to touch them either. The mouth is a private part. So a lot of parents will say to me, well, why are you teaching my kids that the mouth is a private part? And it's like, well, do you want somebody to put something in your kid's mouth? No. So the mouth is a private part. And the rest of my book, I give different examples that kids could be in because I didn't know being abused when my grandfather tickled me that it was wrong. So like if you're in the shower, you know, no one's supposed to be watching you. So ask them to leave and tell somebody. And so the rest of my book is just different things. You know, someone always asks you to sit on their lap when no one is around, you know, tell somebody. 
if somebody takes a picture of you without your clothes on, that's not okay. Tell somebody. So um, my main thing is the same message for the kids and the adults is like teaching them that it's wrong and teaching them that they have to speak up and tell somebody. And the last page of my book says that even if the person is someone you love and trust, you still have to tell somebody because you have to protect yourself. And that's how you do it. So it's hard because like I said, most people are the family members. And I know we're going to get into this later, but every day I share a different survivor story on my Facebook and Instagram page. Um, so every day people send me a picture of them holding a sign and include their story of abuse. And when they talk about the predators, they say how they were threatened. My mom told me someone was going to go to jail or my dad was going to kill someone and my dad was going to go to jail. Some predators threaten the children and say, yeah, you're going to go to foster care or I'm going to kill you. Or I'm going to kill your mom. So that's why in my book, I also say, even if you're being threatened, you still have to tell. Because if somebody would have told me again at school, like, no, you need to tell somebody, I would have probably told again. But because my mother told me not to tell, I believed her and I didn't. I needed to hear that from somebody else. On your, the page of your foundation, um, it reads, sweep the secrets from under the rug. How do you think shame and silence surrounding sexual abuse is affecting the victim? Um, I mean, that's why I love sharing stories every day, because every survivor shares how it affected them. People turn to drugs, sex, and alcohol. When they say when you're abused as a child, you feel like sex is all you have to offer. So you grow up giving yourself to men, maybe becoming a stripper, maybe becoming a prostitute. You know, um, people, the only thing that I didn't go to was suicide. People will write on their stories, you know, they tried to commit suicide four or five, six, seven times and they're still here. And it's like my um, Tell Somebody movement not only brought awareness to others about what's going on, but it brought awareness to me because I had a survivor's book that said the average child molester was a middle aged white man who was married, college educated with kids. That was my grandfather. So I grew up thinking only white men molested. And I would even look at like my black people, cause my dad's black, and think we're not doing this. We don't do sick stuff like this. And it wasn't until people started sending me their stories and posting their pictures that I realized it happened to every race, every religion, every culture. And it affects you badly. You grow up holding the shame and guilt in. That's not for you. That's for our abusers to hold. And you won't know that until you tell somebody. So. I mean, just like you said, someone got out of prison. My mother was molested by her grandfather when she was a kid. And when she told, her parents told her to keep it a secret and her abuse continued. So she did to me what was done to her. My dad, he was molested by a white preacher in Louisiana when he was a kid. And he told me he never told because back then in the South, you don't even speak about sexual abuse, let alone a white man doing it to you. My older brother was molested by two female babysitters when he was younger. And my younger brother molested by my grandfather. So in my immediate family, everybody's been molested. So I know if my family's like this, I know there's tons of other people's families like that also. But yeah, until you, like you said, tweet the secret from under the rug, you're not going to do it. So what I did is I'm a generational um breaker you know what i'm saying i broke the generational curses and that's what i'm trying to empower other people to do be that person in your family that breaks that generational curse be the person that breaks the generational curse that's that is way more powerful than I, I'm, I'm gonna let you say that again because that's <laughs> very crazy. be the person in your family that breaks that generational curse because back then, 20 years ago, my grandfather, my mom, her sisters, they would have never thought. They would have never thought that 20 years later, I would be out here with an organization, with a movement, with books, going to schools, educating people, giving strength to others. They would have never thought. You know what I'm saying? So I'm my ancestor's wildest dreams. And I'm going to be out here breaking generational curses every day. Okay? 
<laughs> wow, that's that's incredible. You know, you're using your your pain to be your purpose. Now, this is the tricky part, right? Because I don't want to say that I found my purpose through my pain because I don't want to say like I need to go through pain to find a purpose. But right. in this world is unavoidable. And a lot of times it comes to you without, you know, like I, like you said, you're a kid. Aaron Showtime Taylor, which is a guy, the guy who just got released from prison last year. He was in prison for 26 years for armed robbery. On his release and, and during his time in, in prison, he goes through this transformation and he's like going down and he does what you're doing right now, which is breaking the generational curse in his life and breaking these traumas. He talks about trauma. People think about traumas as like these big car accidents that happen to you. But no, it's things, these little, uh, no, I'm not going to call it little, things in your life that happen to you are traumatic and they affect the course of your life, the way you view the world, and you, the way you view yourself first and then the way you view the world and the way you act. And so he started talking about self-medicating. He was doing like, he was like cocaine and heroin, all these different drugs just to be okay. These are things that people don't talk about. And in his case, he's a man. So that's another added pressure of being a man. And you don't talk about emotions and feelings and things of this nature. And they don't talk about men being molested because when it's a, when it's a woman, we don't talk about this. And so these are, these are the conversations we're trying to spur on because after he broke those traumas by going to a lot of therapy, by being the change he wants to see in the world, now he's telling his story to help other people as well. So I really want to commend you this is really powerful and I really appreciate the fact that you're using your story and it's going to help somebody. Somebody's going to hear this and you're going to shift their perspective in some way. So thank you for this. Thank you. And actually, it's about turning your pain into power, which is also a quote on the front of my memoir, In Silence Abuse. And Oprah Winfrey actually wrote the quote. I had reached out to her and I was talking to her about my story and she told me I was the perfect role model for turning pain into power so I like to tell everyone that we're all perfect role models for turning pain into power I used to tell people that God was with me when I was being molested but that I had to go through it to help others because like I can't tell you how to get over gambling addiction because I've never been addicted to that right because I was molested, I can bring awareness. So I used to tell people that God was with me and I had to go through it to help others. But then I had to retract that because God was there, but everyone has free will, you know? So God was there, but the devil was there too with my grandfather. So what God did is after I got out that situation, that's where he picked me up and brought me to where I'm at now. So God's not making you go through that to help others he's just taking you from that to not only help yourself but to help others so I well, that, say that. that that is very actually that what you just said i got into a uh, you know how we get into instagram debates now <laughs> and i got into a debate with somebody about this because i said something about my situation and saying that god you know i was supposed to learn something something bad happened and i said what, I'm not going to call it good or bad. I just know that I was supposed to learn something. God wants me to learn something. And somebody asked me, well, if do you think that God is putting us through these bad things so we can learn it? I said, no, I don't think that God is putting us through anything. I think we have free will and we get to choose how what we do in this world. When people do bad things, that's not God. That's us. That's us human. But God has the power to turn the bad things in our life to good. And even the thing that's the worst pains in our life, you can, he, he, God will still be able to turn it to our purpose and turn it into something that's ultimately beneficial for us, but it sucks. And it sucks to go through this, these kind of things. And it's, it's horrible. It's just, I, I can't fathom what it is that I'm hearing about your grandfather, your own family, your grandfather, my grandfather and I, we have conversations about my future kids. I can't imagine, like, it's not, my mind can't even fathom this, you know? So for a kid to have to grow up with this this kind of guilt, this this secret, this some this it's a heavy burden on a kid. So I would like to know more about your rebuilding journey. And you tell your father this. And by the way, you're also holding the secret because your father, you don't feel like your father can handle this. So he's not a safe space either. 
right. you know? Right. So for you now reclaiming your glory, how do you, what, what are the steps that you took to rebuild yourself? So now you told your dad and there's a huge weight lifted up your shoulder, but you have to learn to communicate with your dad again and, and to trust him with information. You have to learn how to speak your truth now. You have to learn how to get your confidence back in yourself and to love yourself. What are the steps you took in this direction? Because that's stuff that we also need to hear. Uh, yeah, you know, definitely. Um, one year before I told my dad, I was actually living in L.A., you know, just trying to pursue other avenues. And things didn't work out. So I ended up having to move back home with him. And for like a year straight, I was just praying to God. And I was like, God, like, what is my purpose in life? Because I know it's not living here with my parents. Like, this not it. Like, what is it? What is it? And I used to just pray every day. And when I told my dad, he actually helped me start to tell somebody. So now I see why I had to be there for that year because I had to spend quality time with my dad. Because once I told him, he was actually the one that told me, well, you need to go on Facebook and you need to let the world know what happened to you. You need to tell them that it was your mom and your grandfather and your aunt and you need to show them a picture of them. Because when your mom and them are walking down the street, I want people to point to them and say, those are the family that let their daughter and son get molested. And I was like, no, I can't do that. I was like, I'm friends with my mom and my aunts on Facebook. Like, I can't just throw them under the bus like that. And he said, I'm sorry to tell you, Alicia, but he said, that's not your family. He said, family wouldn't turn a deaf ear and a blind eye to you when you need help. And when he said that, like, it just hit me. Like, all this time growing up, I felt like my sick white grandfather was like the victim. And here I was a hero growing up because I was keeping the secret, protecting my family, keeping my family together. When he told me that wasn't even my family because they wouldn't have turned a deaf ear and a blind eye. Like, just those words right there are so powerful. Like, I got chills. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, so for the first time in my life, I actually realized I was the victim. So that is another big thing that I want to advocate because a lot of people say they don't want to tell their parents because it's been so long and they don't know what their parents are going to do. I didn't tell my dad growing up because I thought he was going to kill my grandfather. But when I told him, me and my dad actually got the strongest relationship that we've ever had. So the whole 28 years I was alive, that was like the strongest me and him have ever been. We cried together. We just got strong together. So when you think that your parents are going to overreact and do all this, like you're just keeping yourself healing not knowing that once you tell your parents, that's what's going to start. So long story short, I did what he said. I posted a video online of my story. The next day I woke up and I had like 100,000 comments and 500,000 views and 20,000 shares and all these people just saying it happened to me too. It happened to me too. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, growing up, being told I couldn't talk about it, you think you're the only one going through it. So I thought I was the only one that had been molested, you know, and here all these people are telling me they've been through it. And this girl actually wrote me and told me that she didn't want to tell her parents because they were dying of cancer and her mom had brain aneurysms. So I told her not to tell because if something happened to her parents, I didn't want to feel responsible. My dad came home from work. I told him what happened. And he said, no, he said, you told her the wrong advice. He said, as a parent, even on my deathbed, I would want to know what happened to my children. So you need to tell people that they have to tell somebody. So that's even like how to tell somebody even like came about, you know? So two weeks later, again, I was laying in my bed and like God woke me up out my sleep and like put me towards the front window and there was a black car in front of my house and a police officer got out. So like I ran to the front door to ask him like what was going on. And he asked if my dad was there. And I was like, no, my dad's at work. And he was like, man, he's like, I'm sorry to tell you this, but he was like, your dad just died. Like he just hit a tree five miles up the road and he died instantly. And I was like, you're playing. And he was like, no, he's like, here's his wallet in his car keys. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I thought it was a joke, but like it really happened. And so like right when I started telling somebody, not only did my dad die, but then my mom and her family like disowned me. 
like cut me off, block me on social media, you know what I'm saying, change their phone numbers. Like it was just like all sorts of stuff. Your but, mom is Huh? Your mom as well? Did my yes, my mom as well, because um they didn't like that I was sharing my story on social media. They didn't like that I was putting my family business out there, let alone naming them. But what it really was, was they couldn't handle the guilt for them to even be able to go to sleep at night. You know, that's that's what I think of. I have a nephew. I have a daughter. And I always think to myself, if one of them told me they were being abused, I couldn't imagine, you know, just kind of ignoring it and still being able to go to sleep every night, every night, every night for years and me not think about that. So that's what happened is a lot of people are scared to tell on their family because they think their family's going to disown them. People are scared to be the black sheep of their family. But I always tell people, I'm not scared to be the black sheep of my family because me, I think right. So if people in my family don't get along with me, then that means that they're not thinking on the right level. So yes, my family disowned me. But as you saw, we went on the Yonder Fix My Life show and we're rebuilding. When my dad passed away, I buried him in Louisiana in a tell somebody shirt. Every time I wasn't looking, his sisters would go to the casket and zip his jacket up so nobody could see his shirt because they told people that that wasn't the time or place to represent my message. And I just couldn't believe it. So it's like my mom's side of the family and my dad's side of the family all kind of cut me off. Are you frozen? <laughs> I didn't see you. Oh, look, I'm, you, you were I'm, stuck. <laughs> yeah, stories. So funny. Wow, yeah, so I don't know. I just, I've been through a lot, but that's, that's where the healing comes from is because when you keep all the secrets in, you think that you will heal if you don't talk about it. But you have to talk about it. You have to tell your family. You have to cry. You have to break down. You know what I'm saying? You have to just keep living and just going every day. Like that's just part of the healing process. So when I went for a year straight, I prayed, dear God, please help me fix my life. Please help me fix my life. After a year, my book publisher called me and said, Ianla from the Fix My Life show wants to know if you want to come be a guest. And I was like, uh, yeah. To me, that was God answering my prayers because I specifically said, help me fix my life. And here I am on the Fix My Life show. So my mom and my aunt came with me. One of my aunts didn't want to come. My brother didn't want to come. And he said, Alicia, why would you go on TV and share your story with millions of people? And I said, because I get to help millions of people. And he didn't understand that. So he didn't go. But yeah, I went and it was really good. It was a real eye opener. She put my mom through a lot of activities and showed her how she wasn't present with me growing up and she put me through a lot of activities and let me know that if your life is not balanced in all aspects like your love your spiritual spirituality your wealth just your inner health then me trying to put my tell somebody foundation on top of that it's never going to work because I have to be sturdy I have to have all levels of my life even and so she actually told me to take a break from my Tell Somebody Foundation. So for like eight months, I like stepped back and I read self-help books. I spent more time with my family. I spent time communicating with my mom on the phone and rebuilding our relationship. And then I came back to it. So that's another thing that I try to tell people. I don't think that you'll ever fully heal from it. You know what I'm saying? I don't know exactly what happened to you you know, personally, but like you've been through some stuff also and you learn from it, but you're never going to forget that it happened, you know? So for other survivors of abuse, you're never going to forget who abused you and what happened, but you can take your pain, like Oprah said, and turn it into power. And you can take your power back by telling somebody, by sharing your story and in now encouraging others to speak up. I always think about reflection as a way for you to get that power. You're never going to forget. But the goal is to get to a point where you reflect and you take yourself out of that thing. You learn the lesson and you don't continue to live in that story anymore as the victim. Now you turn it into power, like you said, like Oprah said. But I do want to go back and say, I'm so sorry that you lost your dad. 
Um, yeah, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, but what you're saying is really powerful that you continue to tell your story. And, you know, even in Young Latin, you just take a step back and focus on yourself first. Make yourself good before you then try to pour into all these other things. That's really powerful. And I actually might even take that too. Um, what can you do? And it's back to this, this idea of, of teaching and learning from your story. What can we do as, for example, as a friend, a family member, a neighbor, anyone that has suspicion about some kind of abuse going on? How do you approach a situation like that without endangering the victim? Um, well, my Tell Somebody Children's book is a great, you know, um, gift that you can give to a niece, a nephew, you know, to where you don't have to directly say if someone touched me. But I would say that you have to do something because, again, every day I share stories and survivors more. They're just like me. They not only told their mom, but they told their sister or they told their aunt. They told someone at church. Like all the stories are consistent with them telling someone and nothing being done. So you just have to want to help. You have to be that saving grace for a child, you know? So. My children's book, ease into the subject. Um, they even have where you can call CPS and remain anonymous and ask for a child welfare check on a child. And they have to send a worker out there and talk to the child, separate them, you know, you know, and that's all anonymous. So um, anything, anything that you could do to be that saving grace. Mm, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. I'm sure people would love to know that part. Um, you also urged child molesters to seek help. Were you able to somehow forgive your grandfather? Because some people might view this as a mental disease that he didn't go out and get help for. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, when I was older, uh, I actually told my grandmother at the same time that I told my dad uh, that my grandfather molested me. Uh, when I was a teenager, my grandfather actually caught a rare lung disease that they don't even have a cure for yet. And it hardened up his lungs and he died. To me, that was God's karma for him. So he had been dead a while. And when I told my grandma, she told me that my grandfather was molested as a child by somebody in Holland where he was from. And so it's just so rampant and just so common that I understand it. I forgive my grandfather just like I forgive my mother. It's not saying what they did was okay, but I know why they did it. I see why they did it. I, I don't, it's not okay, you know, so I'm not going to see why they did it, but they weren't able to break the generational curse is what it yeah. was. They weren't strong enough to break that. Mm -hmm. And so I asked child molesters to please stop because like I said, I believe in God so much. And uh, one time I was sitting down and someone was like, well, I don't believe in God. If God was alive, why would he let so many bad things happen to so many people? And the reason why I know there's a God is because I, I was supposed to die like 20 different times in my life. Like I done been to parties where they shot it up. I done been in car accidents where my car done rolled over into a ditch and was trapped under some barbed wire. And I was up in there for 30 minutes, like trying to get out. Like I done been, my car done wrapped around the tree. Like I done been in so many instances where I was supposed to die, but like within like an inch, like I made it. And I know that's because I still got a purpose here on earth. And God's like, you know, keeping me alive to get it going. Um, what was the question again? Because sometimes I'd be like going off onto something else. No, and I forgot. I'm just giving you cues for you to tell your story. But the question was about forgiving your grandfather. Oh, uh, yeah. So forgiving my grandfather. Um, yeah, I forgive my mother. I forgive my grandfather. And I just. You have to forgive them for you so that you can get no. freedom, basically, is what that is. Yeah. I wonder if you forgave them for yourself as well, because at the end of the day, holding on to it and saying no, like it's not about them. Forget about like it's it's about you letting go of that thing. So you're not the victim in that situation anymore and forgiving right. yourself first. And then before you you go out into trying to heal them or anything, it's like, yo, like 
I got to let this thing go and not hold on to it and heal myself. And so mm-hmm. that's why. It sounds kind of weird. Sorry to interrupt you. But I just remember telling my dad before he passed away, because he told me that he said, like, you know, I'm so mad at your grandfather. I'm so mad at your mother. And I said, actually, if they would have did something different, if my grandfather wouldn't have molested me, if my mother would have protected me, I wouldn't even have the tell somebody organization. Like I have this based off of what happened to me. So even though molestation seems and sounds and is the worst thing imaginable, I'm appreciative that it happened to me because I get to help other kids going through it. I can imagine like, like before I started this, I worked at like a thrift center. Like I couldn't imagine like that's just my job. Like I get such a fulfillment in helping children and helping survivors and doing what I do, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. So I appreciate what happened to me. And um, I think that's where my forgiveness comes in also. As we're winding down, I have two more questions for you, but I want to dive deeper into your rebuilding and the things that you did to cope with the traumas. What, what did you do? How did you, how, you know, you talk about being able to forgive, you talk about talking to people, but were there other things that you were able to do that, that you found helpful in, in dealing with these traumas in order to break the generational curse? Um, it's really a support system. That's what it is. You need a support system. When I was younger, I told my cousin that I was molested, but because she had never been molested, the only thing that she could tell me was, I'm sorry to hear that, but that's it, you know? But what if I would have told someone else who was molested? They might have told me, oh, well, you need to go to therapy and you need to go to counseling and you need to read self-help books and you need to get affirmation cards. Just realize that you're worthy. You're somebody like this is just one thing. Let it brush off you like you're going to be somebody in life. So it's all about the support. So I think it was really when I started tell somebody that that's really where I started my healing journey. Because if you look under every picture, there's complete strangers that are telling you, like, I love you. I see you. I believe you. When your own family what, weren't even giving you that, you know, you're getting more love from strangers. So it's support. And that's what I also always tell people at the end of my stories is seek therapy or counseling because that really helps. Like, you really have to work on yourself. You can't just tell your story and then just go on. You have to do the work. So that's what I was saying about God was that um, and I forgot again I'm sorry listen I'd be like thinking about so many things and like trying to jump to this and then I forget my point when I when I'm going there but I'll think about it later maybe also like so this is the the really cool thing here is just that um, you've been able to take this thing and the point of this podcast I, I keep going back to the, the point because it's important is the fact that you could talk to people who have gone through similar things. And not only does it help them, it also helps you to... <laughs> um, but it helps, it helps you as well because they can t- show you things. I mean, everybody is, is a master of something. They've learned something. They've done something. They've done some kind of reflection and some kind of therapy that has worked for them. And in that way, you can learn something from them as well. So that's what's powerful about what you just said. My last question, though, is you talking to your young self. If you had to talk to your young self about your life so far and what you've learned, what would you say to young Alicia? Oh, man, I ain't got no tissues over here. You're going to make me cry and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Um, I mean, I would just tell myself to just keep going, you know, just keep fighting. Like, it's hard, especially being a sick seven, eight year old, um, or even younger, you don't really understand. It's not till you are an adult that you understand like concepts. But I would just tell myself, like, you know, just keep fighting, just keep fighting till you get there. Cause I would have never known, like I said, that I would be writing books or I'd be helping people. And like you said, not only am I able to touch women and men, I'm able to touch six year olds at school. I'm able to touch 18-year-olds reading it. I'm able to touch 60-year-olds that are reading it. I'm able to touch white people, black people. Like, I'm able to touch the world with the message to tell somebody. And now I remember what I was going to say was that 
I believe so much in God that when I pray for something, it usually happens. So that's why at the end of every story, I say, child molesters, please seek help. Please seek therapy. Because every night I actually pray for child molesters. And I actually ask God that he gives strength to child molesters not to hurt children. Because I figure if I could pray for something for me and it comes true, why not be able to pray for somebody else? So that's something that I like to also share with people. Like, if you could pray for other people, like, yeah, pray for child molesters. Pray that they get strength not to hurt children. And pray that children have the strength to come out and tell somebody. Oh, my gosh. What an incredible... Wow, you are an incredible person. And and it takes a certain level of awareness to understand that you have to pay, pray for those people as well because they're in pain. And they're and hurt people always hurt people. So you have to pray to get the strength and get the healing they need so they stop hurting people. So thank you for your message. Thank you for your story. Thank you for what you're doing in the world. It's so important. I, I always say this quote, that good people have to feel like they're standing in front of the ocean and trying to empty it with a spoon. And that's how much bad and evil there is in this world. And you're holding a spoon and I'm holding a spoon and everybody, we just got to keep all banding together. And eventually we're going to make a dent in this ocean of evil. But man, your work is so important. I really appreciate you much. Well, yeah, my website is tell somebody today. So I always say, don't tell somebody tomorrow. Don't tell somebody next week. Don't tell somebody next year. Tell somebody today. Tell somebody today dot org. So that's also, how you can come find me. Your, you got to give us all your things, everything that we can find you on Instagram, Twitter, to TikTok. <laughs> yeah, well, tell somebody today dot org is actually the best way because it has like my Facebook link, my Instagram link, my Twitter and everything on there awesome. so just tell somebody today.org and you can just find oh, everything my- yeah tell somebody today.org say it one more time tell somebody don't tell somebody tomorrow don't tell somebody next week don't tell somebody next year tell somebody today tell somebody today.org who's gonna break to- those generational curses who's gonna do that yes 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 i've Lord. been at so many places that like yeah when i do a podcast the internet will go out the ring light will break you know i'm on my way to an event my tire will pop when you're doing god's work when you're shining a light on the devil he's gonna be mad so every morning that's how i get up kind of like what's up devil like what you got for me today you know what what little minor thing are you gonna throw at me today that i'm gonna you know stomp and walk right over and keep doing what i'm doing so that's just really what i try to just give people i just want people to see my strength and just like get it you know what i'm saying and just go through life just the same way thank you thank you for your message thank you for what you're doing let's keep going and devil ain't got nothing on us can't see our back so let's (laughs) i'm gonna keep rolling all right yeah Hey, Fess is here. I hope you liked that episode. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and here's some more episodes that you might like. Uh, I mean, on this side.